Recordings in progress. All right. So a few weeks ago, we went over Hal Swayze's blueprint for success. So we have a bunch of blueprints, Mike Ferry agents, so on and so forth. They go over their blueprint for success, all these wonderful things. I think they're great to review. The one I wanted to go over today was, was a guy named Dan Evans. So if the name sounds familiar, Dan Evans was a guy that Neil interviewed uh, last year. <clears throat> he was, I don't know, maybe somewhere, you know, 15th interview or something like that. He was a phenomenal interview. What was great about him is how humble he was and um, all the great things that he had to say. So he wrote out a blueprint for success. I picked Dan's to review with everyone for a couple different reasons. Number one, <clears throat> we spend a lot of time hearing from two different agents. We hear from the our agents that we hear from, you know, the Melinda's, the Mark and Al's, the Jennifer's, Nancy's, so and so forth. We hear from them. And we hear from a lot of the same Mike Ferry people, the Hal Swayze's, Bernie Gallerini's, Karen Bernardi's, Valerie Carlos, so on and so forth. What I love about Dan is that Dan is one of those guys that is never on stage at the Mike Ferry events or in anything along those lines. He just kind of quietly goes about his day and does 125 transactions a year in Orem, Utah. Okay. If anyone knows who, where Orem, Utah is, good for you. <laughs> okay. He just kind of quietly goes about his day doing that. So it's always nice to hear from these people. It's like a different, a different person to hear from than kind of the same people you hear from all the time. So that was one of the reasons. Two, <clears throat> What I like about Dan's blueprint is it's not that he, the way he words things, and you'll see as we go over that, is not your typical, well, I get up, I prospect, I follow my schedule, I role play every day, and I go on appointments, and you know, that's it. You know, Because sometimes where I feel we get disconnected from some of these speakers and agents is that we feel like, yeah, 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 okay, I got it. Like, what else do you have? It's, it seems like the same thing. That's some of the feedback I get sometimes. He kind of has a different way of looking at things from his blueprint for success. Now, he's not saying anything you haven't heard before, and as you'll see these eight points, but it's just kind of really neat on how he goes about doing this. And the third reason I picked Dan is because, again, he's a very humble guy. This is a guy that does 125 deals a year, and he'll tell you how much he sucked his first 10 years as a real estate agent, and that today he's just mediocre. OK, so he's very, very humble about that. So I, I think he has a really great blueprint for success. I want to go over that because I think there's a few things that you'll really get out of this in a positive way. So without further ado, let's jump into this. <clears throat> I don't know if these are in any particular order of importance. I'm just going to read them as he listed them, which is one through eight. So he says here, this is my blueprint on how I went from an OK agent to a great agent, okay? From an okay agent to a great agent. So let's jump in. Number one, transparency, transparency. And what he says about transparency is this, dropping my pride started a good path to actually improving. Dropping my pride started a good path to actually improving. So here's what that means, you know, because I talked to Dan a little bit about this. In real estate, the way he worded it, right, is he said that there's a lot of ego and mediocrity. And what he means by that is as a real estate agent, because we are in an industry, and whether it's in Southern California or in his market in Orem, Utah, we are in an industry where not many people produce. As a matter of fact, you hear the numbers all the time, given year, fit around 50% nationally, people with an active real estate agent, real estate license will not close a deal. In our MLS, because I run these numbers, it's about 47% of people in our local MLS have an active real estate agent, haven't closed a deal in the last 12 months. Now, some of that's the last, the last 12 months, a variety of different reasons that could have happened, but this happens every 12 months. This is not a, a COVID you know, type of situation. This is pretty regular. 
and you have 80% of people close three or less transactions. So when Dan's talking about dropping his pride is that he was doing eight, 10 transactions. And in Orem, Utah, when you're doing eight to 10 transactions, you are one of the highest producers in your office. Okay. And realistically, because 80% of people close three or less transactions in a year, eight to 10 transactions in any market, you are a top producer. Hell, in Southern California, you're doing eight to 10 transactions. All of a sudden you need a team, but we'll get down that path a different day. <laughs> okay. So what he realized though, is that got to his head. Well, I'm, I'm one of the highest producers. I, I've got all these other people asking me how I'm doing things. I'm looking at all these other people struggling. I'm doing eight to 10 transactions. I'm doing really well. It was an ego thing because the reality was he had so much room to grow. And this is a great example for all of us, okay? Is that in Southern California, you might close three, four, five deals and you're making 50, $60,000 in some cases. And you're thinking, I'm living pretty good. I make more money than the average person in the United States. I'm closing about, you know, transactions that are, you know, decent for a real estate agent. As far as our industry goes, I'm doing pretty good. The ego gets in the way. If you drop that, that's when you start improving. And that's what he means. When I dropped my pride, started me on a good path to actually improving. Because just because you're doing deals when other people aren't doesn't mean you're doing as many deals as you should be doing. Just because you've made a few bucks because the prices are so high doesn't mean you shouldn't be making more. But our ego gets in the way and we think we've got this figured out because we're in an industry where so many people don't produce. You have to drop the pride, drop the ego and realize what's possible. Okay. Now, this is hard for us in Southern California. Why is this? What's the main reason, realistically, why this is hard for us in Southern California? Anybody want to take a shot in the dark? Why it's harder for us to drop the pride and ego in Southern California as compared to Orem, Utah? High price. There it is. The prices. See, in Orem, Utah... <clears throat> When the average price is $220,000 and you're making five or six grand a deal, you really have to drop the ego because you need to do 15 deals. You need to do 20 deals. You know, and then eventually you get to him where he's doing 125. California, you don't necessarily need to drop the ego as much because again, our prices are 600, 700, 800,000. We're making eight, 10, 15, $20,000 a deal. Uh, I don't necessarily need to drop my pride so much because if I could do three, four or five deals, I'm living good. So it's a mindset thing that you have to not just look at where you're at, but what else is possible. Okay. So that's the big thing with transparency. I'm so glad he did that one. Number one, because it's a huge thing. Last point I'll make on this. <clears throat> and then we'll get to not, not all the points are going to be this long. <laughs> okay. I promise you. Otherwise we'll be here till five. Right. The last point I'll make on transparency, I, I will always remember this. <clears throat> Matt, one of the, the Mike Ferry superstar retreats a few years back. And again, I have the coach VIP badge on. So when you have that, people tend to walk up to you and you know ask questions. So I have this, I'm walking around. This agent comes up to me and you know, she said, Hey, you know, I'd love to just kind of pick your brain a little bit. Sure, go ahead. And the the basis of this story is she said, Well, this is my my fourth year, start my fourth year. And this year I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get it. I'm like, wow, good for you. I said, okay. So tell me about your first year. She says, well, my first year in business, I did 18 transactions. Now I sat there with her and I went, oh, okay. All right, good. Now in my head, I'm going, holy crap, 18 transactions, your first year. I think you've got this figured out. <laughs> okay. Second year I did 33. Last year I did 41, but I'm telling you, Robert, this year, I'm really going to figure it out. Now she's doing 41 transactions in year three, but here was the kicker. I said, okay, great. Tell me a little bit about where you're from and things like that. She was from a small town where the average commissions were 5,500 bucks. And I said, that's why her mindset is I have to figure it out because I'm doing 41 deals, but I'm, I'm getting $5,500 a deal. 
Now I thought, I always thought to myself, what if we took that mindset, but put it in our market and with $15,000 paychecks? Imagine what would be possible. So just a different mindset you have to think about. Okay, number two, blueprint for success, accountability. Accountability. This is what he says about accountability. Setting up daily and weekly accountabilities, setting up daily and weekly accountabilities increased my consistency, which increased my production. Setting up daily and weekly accountabilities increased my consistency, which increased my production. <clears throat> Who here sometimes needs a little push to do what they're supposed to do every day? So me and Armand and 25 liars. I'm ready to do <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Great, great, great. All right. We have to accept the fact that we need daily or weekly accountability because we will let ourselves off the hook. No matter how hard we are on each other, on, on ourselves. Oh, I'm pretty disciplined. I'm really hard on myself. I hold myself to a really high standard. Okay, great. You will let yourself off the hook easier than an accountability partner has or the accountability partner will. So you need to set up daily, weekly accountabilities. It doesn't, now here's the thing. Why some people don't do accountabilities is either A, because of ego, which I don't think that's one of the main reasons, okay? <clears throat> Two, you set up accountability partners and your accountability partners are not accountable. So therefore they can't hold you accountable, okay? <laughs> so you need accountability partners that are also accountable. Or three, you think setting up an accountability system is too difficult. Well, you know, I got to find a partner and then what do I, what's the, what's the accountability? There's money involved. And it, it doesn't have to be that. You can, if you want to put some money on it or some sort of prize or penalty on it, if you want to, but sometimes the best accountability partners is just someone that's willing to ask why. So here's what I mean. Hey, did you, okay. Your goal today was 25 contacts. Did you make it? I didn't make it. Why? And then you have to come up with an answer. Sometimes that's all it takes. Because then you have to come up with some bogus answer. Well, I didn't do it because this and this and this. And how many times are you going to do that before you get annoyed with it? Probably pretty quickly. So sometimes accountability partner could be, just be that. Now, again, if you want to put money on it, that's a whole different thing. So here's the, the best example I have of that recently. So Jack Ma has a fourth quarter accountability partners. And he has, he has to get 125 contacts a week. He's got a few different things. There's four or five different things he has to do every week. One of them is 125 contacts. If he doesn't do one of the activities at the end of the, at the end of each week, he has to pay a thousand dollars. Okay. So my call with him on Friday, <clears throat> our coaching call on Friday, uh, I, he said, I, I want to let you know that, uh, I hit my 125 for the week. I said, okay, great. He said, but I'm telling you right now, Robert, and this is what he told me. If it wasn't for my accountability partners, I would have only made about 60. Oh, wow. Tell me more about that. He goes, they, I did. He goes, there were days things got in the way. I didn't really feel like prospecting. I didn't really feel like hitting my numbers, but I thought to myself, I don't want to let my accountability partners down. And I said, well, you probably, and I joked, I said, well, you don't want to lose a thousand dollars. And he said, he started laughing. He goes, yeah, he goes, but you know what the truth is? It was more about letting my accountability partners down than $1,000. So he did it. He got the 125 contacts for the week, but if he didn't have it, he would only got 60. His words. It's that little extra push, that consistency that makes all the difference in the world. So set it up, find somebody that doesn't have to be mean, but is just willing to ask you why you didn't do it. All right, number three, practice and role play. <clears throat> Practice and role play. What he says about practice and role play is memorizing the scripts and dialogues transformed both my confidence and presentation abilities. Memorizing the scripts and dialogues transformed both my confidence and presentation abilities. Look, there's not a lot to say here because you've heard me say this. You've heard Neil say this. You've heard Mike say this. You've heard every agent in the world say this. Memorizing the scripts and dialogues transforms confidence, makes you a better presenter. You don't have to worry about what to say. 
You can actually listen. You know all the stuff. This is just another reminder from another great agent in Orem, Utah, saying the same thing. Now, here's the thing. Let me ask you a question. Do you think in Orem, Utah, they use different scripts? What do you think? You think they use different scripts in Orem, Utah? No. 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 He uses the same scripts that we use. And it works for him. So it's just another reminder. It's the scripts. It's the dialogues. It gives you confidence, makes you a better presenter. And it doesn't matter where you are. Everyone can use this and be successful. This is what I remember Tony Smith saying one day. He said, this is the beauty of learning the system, okay? Is that you could be dropped off anywhere in the United States and you could go out and sell homes. You'd have to go know the marketplace, but you'd already know what to say and how to say it because the script works in LA, the same way it works in Utah, same way it works in Florida and New York and everywhere in between and around. So get out of the head that, well, you know, my market's different. My people are different. Doesn't matter. I wrote down here underneath this, this wasn't from Dan Evans, but what I just, it just came to my thought with practice and role play about where he's from Utah is we interviewed Christoph Chu. For those of you who don't know, Christoph Chu is one of the highest producing agents in Beverly Hills and only does like one, two plus million dollar properties, only high end stuff. And usually it's even higher than that. <clears throat> and yeah, we asked him, he said, so what scripts do you use? And he says, well, I use the Mike Ferry scripts. I was like, yeah, but you use $10 million properties. Do you go to a $10 million listing and say, I wrote down three real important questions? He says, absolutely. So we have to get out of our head that the script doesn't work, number one, okay? And number two, that your market's different. You, your, your people are different, okay? <clears throat> I joke about this all the time that Jack Ma sends me a listing presentation every week in Chinese. And still to this day, I don't speak Chinese, but I know where he is in the script. <laughs> and so I, and so I said, you, do you translate this, the Mike Ferry script to Chinese? He said, yeah, it's just a different language. So it doesn't matter. All right. Number four, exposure to bigger thinkers, exposure to bigger thinkers. Now this is a long one. So we'll take our time with this one as far as what he says. And this is what he says about exposure to bigger thinkers. I didn't understand this for a long time. But being around bigger thinkers not only showed me what was possible, but showed me it was possible. So I'm going to read that again. I didn't understand this for a long time, but being around bigger thinkers not only showed me what was possible, but showed me it was possible. It took me a long time for this to be a benefit and not feel jealousy. So that's a key, key point, okay? Didn't understand this for a long time. Bigger thinkers showed me that what was possible or that what was possible, but that it was possible and that it became a benefit, not jealousy. One, in this particular group, you're surrounded with big thinkers, but you're only within this group for a certain amount of time. So you have to ask yourself, outside of this group, are you surrounding yourself continuously with big thinkers? Because you can't work with big thinkers here five, six, seven, eight hours a day, however long you're here within this group a day. And then for the rest of the 16 hours, be around small thinkers that are holding you down. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You have to constantly surround yourself with that. So you have to identify the people around you, not just here, but outside of here. Are you working with big thinkers? Are you dealing with people that think big, that want big, that dream big, that have big goals? Because if you're not, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a hard time for you to get to that point. But here's the other key thing he said is that it took a long time for this to be a benefit and not feel jealousy. Let's be honest. 
Who here sometimes hears about people ultra successful and gets a little sense of jealousy? Just me, great. Thank you, Gustavo. You get, get a little bit like, oh, well, how do they do it? They must have this. They must have that. They must know this, right? Well, they're in that market. They know these people. That's different, right? You're, you're trying to, every, we do that. But when we do that, we're actually hindering ourselves, not just from a mental standpoint, but to grow to be like those individuals, whether it's in real estate or anything else. You know, we look at people, the, the you know, people that are in your 20s and 30s, and it's like, well, it's impossible to buy a house. And yet people in 20s and 30s do it all the time. You know what I mean? Oh, it's impossible to make, do that many deals, make that much money. And yet people do it all the time from all walks of life. You have to constantly expose yourself to that type of situation. Is it easy? Hell no, it's not easy. But you have to really, really focus around big thinkers, people that have goals that want to do things. Okay, it's huge. It's huge. Now, here's the trick. You have to balance big thinking with dreamers who don't take action. Okay, it's a little bit of a balance. So here's what I mean. You probably all know somebody who constantly is like, well, I've got the, they're the, <laughs> they're the, anyone ever seen the show Seinfeld? Okay. If you've ever seen the show Seinfeld, one of the characters is Kramer, Cosmo Kramer. And we all know the Cosmo Kramers in our life. And what I mean by that is if you ever seen the show, Kramer always comes up with these elaborate ideas on how he's going to make it rich. It's a place where you make your own pizza pie. It's a cologne that smells like the beach. It's, it's this, it's, it's a telescope that you put, it's, it's this and this. He's got, always got all these, I got these ideas, big dreamer. He's going to make it big. And Jerry always like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then he never follows through with any of them. Kramer never follows through with any of them. So <laughs> you have to be balanced that, yeah, hey, this is cool. I'm, I'm surrounding myself with people that are thinking big. They have dreams. They have plans. But you have to also make sure you're with some people that not only have those thoughts, but also take action on some of these thoughts. Okay. I want to do this. And okay, now I'm moving towards this goal. <laughs> Otherwise, you're stuck with people and just in... Fantasy land, I guess, would be the perfect word for this type of scenario. So you have to balance that a little bit. <clears throat> All right, number five, letting things go. Letting things go. What he said about letting things go is this. The more I let go of tasks that weren't earning money or that I was not good at, the more productivity I had. I'm going to read that again. The more I let go of tasks that weren't earning me money or that I was not good at, the more productivity I had. <clears throat> I wrote down underneath this, there's a quote from John Ames, who's another real estate agent that's always at the Mike Ferry retreats. He says, if it's not earning you any money, delegate. If it's not a money earning activity, delegate it. Some of you are like, can I delegate my prospecting? No, you can't delegate prospecting. That's a money, that's a money, money earning activity. But you have to, you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, you know what you can delegate and what you can't. Worrying about the title report is not a money-making activity. Get someone else to do that. Worrying about escrow is not a money-making activity. Get someone else to do that. <clears throat> Following up on disclosures, not a money-making activity. Get somebody to do that. Let go of all these things. Well, I want to build a really great website. Do you know how to build websites? No. Then have somebody else do it. Instead of spending three hours a day every day for six months trying to figure it out. I really want to work on this really great flyer. You know how to create flyers? No. Then get someone else to do it. Pay them if you have to. But in most cases, you don't even have to. There's systems that can do that. 
but get rid of the tasks so they're not earning you money, which also means you might be doing earning tasks that are still not earning you any income. So Robert, what the hell does that mean? You might be doing things that you think are income earning tasks, but they're not earning you any money. Meaning, for example, well, I'm prospecting. Okay, great. Who are you prospecting for sale by owners? Okay, great. How long have you been prospecting them? Five years. Great. Have you ever had a deal? No. Okay. You're doing an income producing activity that's not producing any income. You might have to let that go. Or get better somehow. Okay. But also the things that he wasn't good at. Oh, sorry. The things that he wasn't good at. Because let's be honest. Can you don't you don't have to answer what it is, but can you identify something right off the bat that you are not good at? Yes. Just me. Okay. The things that you're not good at have someone else do them. You can work at getting better at it, but as you're working towards getting better at it, have someone else do it. Let it go. That can be, that is better at it. I do that all the time with people like Jesse and Jocelyn. You know, could I figure out how to go into 21 online and put together a flyer for you? 100%. I absolutely could figure that out. But it might take me 20 minutes or it'll take Jocelyn two. She's better at that. So if you call me and ask me for something about that, I'm going to give you to her. Not because I can't figure it out, but because she's better, she's faster. If you're having some minor tech issue, could I figure it out? Probably. Major tech issue, no. Minor, I probably could. But it might take me some time. Jesse can figure it out in seconds. So I'm going to send you over to him. So you have to, again, it's the, the pride. This goes back to also letting go of your pride. I can do it. I got it, right? That male macho machismo, I, 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 I could do this. Okay. <laughs> Let it go. Let somebody who's, just admit that some people are smarter than you at certain things and let them do it. <laughs> it's funny. All right, last three points. Number six, having a plan for the money I make and making bigger plans for the money. Having a plan for the money I make and, make her bigger, and making bigger plans for the money. I wrote this down. I've said this before. It bears repeating. If you don't know what you're going to exchange the money for, you're not going to do the work because prospecting sucks. You have to have a clear plan for the money you're going to make. If I make this much money, it goes where? Goes to savings. Okay, what's the savings for? Or it goes towards, I wanna to buy a house. Okay, great. What kind of house? Be more specific. I wanna go on vacation. I wanna do this. It can be, this is important. It can be materialistic. See, sometimes, here's the truth. Sometimes we don't make the connection to the money or the plan for the money because we think too deep and really we're very superficial. Don't get mad. <laughs> okay. That's not true. I would do anything for my kids. I'm not saying you wouldn't, but I'm saying paying for your kids karate might not excite you as much as paying for a vacation to Italy. Don't be upset. It can be a superficial thing. It can be a materialistic thing. God, I really would love to send my kid to college, but I'd really rather have a yacht. <laughs> okay, then be honest with yourself and have the plan for the yacht because you're not going to work as hard if it's not that exciting for you. Right? Now, for some of you, it will be. For some of you, it will be. Neil's talked about this before, how his goal was he wanted, if whatever college his kids got into, he wanted to pay for it. For some of you, it will be deep. It will be family related. It will be straight from the heart type of things. For others of you, it won't. And that's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to be honest with yourself of having a plan for the money you're going to make and then start making bigger plans. 
Otherwise you get stuck in neutral. What's the, oh, we just bought the new house. Well, what's the next one? We just went on vacation. Where's the next one? Bigger plans, better plans. Need to have a plan for the money. All right, number seven, great mentors. Great mentors. This is what he says about great mentors. Having the coaching that MFO, Mike Ferry Organization, has provided me has been invaluable and a game changer. Having the coaching that MFO has provided me has been invaluable and a game changer. He continues to say, actually reading and listening to it and participating more in MFO, pro MFO programs has been great. Actually reading and listening to it and participating more in MFL programs has been great. So in his case, it was the Mike Ferry organization incorporating himself within the organization. We've heard this before. It's one thing to be a Mike Ferry agent, a Neil Schwartz agent, a Tom Ferry agent, a Brian, but it's one thing, whatever, whatever, whoever you follow. Okay, I'm not here to push anything on anybody. Whoever you follow, it's one thing to say, well, I go to the events and I'm technically one of those types of agents. It's another thing to immerse yourself in it. Okay. As he says, reading, listening, participating more. That's what got him in. So you have to do the same thing, whether again, it's Mike Ferry, whether it's Century 21 Masters, whether it's Tom Ferry or Brian Buffini or any other mentor type system you go tony robbins not even real estate particularly related but his system you know um grant cardone barbara cochran you know all these other different people that they have these systems you know coaching systems and things like that you have to immerse yourself in it going to a seminar and then not doing anything for the next couple of months about it is not going to be the same thing. You have to constantly read. You have to watch. You have to listen. You have to then participate. We do that here. Open mic. Okay. Tell me about your wins. Listing presentation role plays. All these variety of different things. Participate in it. The more you do that, the better it will be. Again, I'm not pushing any particular system on anybody. Figure out what works for best for you. Be honest with yourself because the reality is most of us follow Mike Ferry. Some of us don't. I don't, it is what it is. So follow the people that you think are going to help you the best. I'm versatile enough. Neil's versatile enough to work with you on that and get better with it. But you have to immerse yourself in the situation. That's why I like the great thing that Mike talks about. He's, he said this he said this story a number of times. If you've ever been to any of his seminars, he said, you know, he goes one day, he goes to the retreat and he walks in early and there's a lady there. And she says, are you going to talk about the same things you talked about last year? And he said, do you remember what I talked about last year? And she said, no. And he said, well, then I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Don't be that person. Immerse yourself in the situation. All right. And the last one, number eight, he says, luck, luck. Luck. Here's what he says about luck. We all have it. That said, I get luckier the harder I work. We all have it. That said, I get luckier the harder I work. So the reason I like that point is because you have to accept the fact that sometimes it is just luck. That you just stumbled upon a situation, right? You happen to be at the elevator at the exact same time that this person needed a real estate agent, okay? Or whatever the case may be. Sometimes it's just luck. Aaron Kerman, right? Who's now one of the highest producing real estate agents in the world in Beverly Hills will tell you the very, his very first day, his very first day, as a, as a licensed real estate agent in Beverly Hills, this was back when they had floor time, right? Where it's like your floor time is one to one thirty. Any calls that come in, you take it. He got a call his very first day of floor time, ended up getting a $1.5 million listing his very first day. And he'll tell you about how he got the listing and he thought for a second, oh, wow, what a really easy business. And then he realized after that, that, um, yeah, so it turns out that that was pure luck because I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Okay. 
So now he eventually became who he is today. Again, like I said, one of the highest producing real estate agents in the world. But he just happened to get dumb luck that he got that call the very first day. All right. So you have to accept the fact that luck will happen. But the lucky, you, the harder you work, the luckier you will get. That's what always seems to happen. Oh, they get all the luck. It's because they're out there more. They're in more conversations. The more conversations you have, you're bound to get luckier to find more deals. The more activities you're doing, the more, the, just the more stuff you're doing, the harder you work, you're putting yourself in more situations to find luck. Because you have to remember, I, I say this all the time, but it has, you have to get this through in terms of luck. Nancy Dupre gets rejected more than anybody here, probably, okay? Some of you are in the same boat. So we think, oh, well, you know, Nancy Dupre, you know, she, she probably stumbles on all these things. She's got this great database, you know, she's, she does all this stuff. And we all like Nancy, she does a great job. But we, sometimes we have that thought in our head. She gets rejected 149 times a week. But one time a week, she gets a listing and she takes 40 listings, 40 to 45 listings a year. But she gets, she does 150 contacts. So she gets rejected 149 times a week. And so some of us get rejected 40 times a week, 50 times a week. And we think, well, gosh, she gets all the luck. She's getting rejected far more than anybody else. She's just putting herself out there more. So therefore, she, every so often, she'll stumble upon a deal where she gets somebody who has a listing and then also, by chance, um, has like uh, three other properties that she had no idea about. But it's because she gets rejected more than anybody else. So you have to accept the fact that the harder you work, the luckier you will get. Very interesting stuff. All right. So that was Dan Evans' blueprint for success. Questions on anything that we went over? Oh, you got it. Very good. All right, everybody. Robert. Like, uh, Robert. Yes. What's the difference? I mean, I kind of get the difference, but can you say what the difference is between having the mentor and then having the people that are around you? Because are those seem very similar? They, they, they are very similar. So good question. The difference being the mentor versus the people around you. A mentor is like, like the mic is like an org, a, a person, a, a particular person or an organization. So like Mike Ferry would be a mentor. Neil would be a mentor, someone that you can follow their system and really um, get involved with what they're doing. The people around you are friends, family, colleagues, stuff like that, that are just people you associate with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a little bit of the difference. So a lot like in Dan's case, he looks at Mike Ferry or the Mike Ferry organization as his mentorship is I want to immerse myself in everything Mike Ferry. I the scripts, the Mike Ferry TV, the retreats. I'm going to read the reports. I'm, I'm immersing myself. That's his mentor. His people, that exposure to bigger thinkers are people in his accountability group, his role play partners, people in just his everyday life, things like that. Hmm. Sounds like you have to, sounds like you have to move away from a bunch of people. <laughs> uh, well, Valley, I, I've talked about this a number of times. I've talked about this a number of times. You really do. In some cases you do. And I, I've had to have some really tough conversations with people years ago, you know, not in a mean way, but it was just, Hey, look, we're, we're at different paths. I'm trying to go here. You're cool here. And I'm continuously hitting my head up against the ceiling. So you really do sometimes have to have those difficult conversations with people or, or just kind of slowly start moving away from certain people, organizations, things along those lines. So uh, yeah, that, that does make a difference because the truth is you can be around. Mike, Mike talked years ago, Mike told us this at a, at a coach's training. 
he said, you know, the, you have to understand as a coach, one of the biggest things that we have to get out of our head is how influential we are. <laughs> and of course, all the coaches in the room are like, what are you talking about? You know, we're great, you know, because we're all, you know, when you first become a coach, your ego is massive. And as you get older as a coach, your ego becomes very minimal. But Mike had said, you're, you have to get out of the influence. And he said, realistically, they have, if let's just, he said, let's just break it down for simple math, 30 minute segments. And, and they work 40 hours a week. They have 80, 30 minute segments. You are coaching them for one of them. So you really only influence one 80th percent of their work week. So while that one 80th percent can make a difference, if they're only listening to you and then the other 79 out of 80, they're around negative thinkers, small thinkers, that one call you had with them is meaningless. So it's a whole combination of things. So sometimes you really do have to have conversations with people or move away from people slowly and find different, different people to hang out with, or at least different people to be accountable with and things like that. I, I think that until you find your group or you get uh, that into a group, it's probably good to just get your book thing going because then at least you're reading stuff that's changing because i know that's another thing that mike and neil say you have yeah. to yeah so okay there you go Robert. all right everybody good stuff good job way to go i appreciate